Hey everyone, welcome back to Open. I'm Rina Valentin, your host of Café con Leche, encouraging you to get social with us, especially during these social distancing times. That uh, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at uh, BronxNet TV and uh, like us on Facebook at Open BronxNet Television. And while you're there, you can follow me and reach out to me personally. I'm on uh, Twitter, Instagram, FB, and LinkedIn at Rina Valentin. So as COVID-19 continues to spread throughout New York City, some communities seem to be impacted more than others. And according to the New York Department of Health, Black and Latino communities have seen a higher number of death rates due to COVID-19. The question is, why are minorities disproportionately being impacted by the virus? Joining us to discuss more on this topic, we welcome Assembly Member of the 72nd District, Carmen de la Rosa. Hello. Hi, thank you for having me today. And thank you for finding the time to be with us. And um, I wanted you to introduce yourself to our audience because um, you have uh, developed yourself within the business of politics, for lack of a better word. Sorry if I'm using that term, but um, you've been in this field since uh, 2007. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I'm an immigrant. I immigrated here from the Dominican Republic as a small child. Um, and my parents um, came to Washington Heights area of Manhattan. Um, and so when I graduated from college, I decided to go um, and look for work. And I ended up at the front door of an assembly member's office on the Upper West Side. And at that time, I interviewed to be his scheduler. Um, and I worked in his office for five years and did every job in that office, including being his scheduler, being the person to um, do casework. And finally, I went on to be to run that district office. Um, and then in 2014, I took a job as a chief of staff for the city council member representing the community where I lived. And I learned about how to make laws and how to balance a budget in the city level. And then in 2017, I decided that you know, if I was good enough to work for these men, I was good enough to put on my running shoes and run. And I ran against an incumbent and I won. Um, and I've been serving in the assembly ever since. And it's been an honor to find my voice and be able to represent and advocate for my community. That's a lovely story. Thank you for sharing. My pleasure. Um, and, and it totally makes a difference because um, I think it's important that people understand how invested certain ele elected officials are. Um, it's not just about being in office and um, and also what you offer um, with for your services, as your services, I should say. And so the fact that you are servicing this particular area that is predominantly uh, minorities, uh, let's talk a little bit about this uh unfortunate situation with the uh, death toll being predominantly Latino and African-American. Yeah. I mean, it's an alarming death toll when you hear that 39% of Latinos and 28% um, of, of African-Americans and Black have died due to COVID. Um, we know that we, we make up together the largest group population-wise, but we also know that we've been the most disadvantaged when it comes to having access. So while we are alarmed by the statistics and really the deaths in our community have taken people from us that matter so much, people that are loved ones. I mean, I can't tell you how many parents of people that I went to school with, I see every single day are passing away. Um, you know, we're not shocked by the fact that our community has been disproportionately left behind once again in this crisis. Um, we don't have access, right? I feel like the lack of access and the um, the instability of, for example, the economics of our communities and the housing situation in our communities has really led to this crisis being amplified um, with the Latinos and the African Americans. So in a lot of my research, what I've been reading is that um, they're saying that the uh, part of the reason uh, for these uh, disparities uh, is based on, um, you know, pre-existing diagnosis such as diabetes, mm -hmm. such as um, obesity. Um, then, of course, there's the uh, access, like you say, to medical insurance and, mm -hmm. and getting care. So how do you think this is going to affect uh, the next phase of this whole pandemic that we're enduring right now? Yeah. Because uh, honestly, 
it, it, it's like, oh, okay, so it took a pandemic for uh, this to really come into full light. Um, yeah, absolutely. How, how do you see this being worked out right now during this emergency crisis? This is what I think. I think that a lot of us that have been working in this field in government and politics have seen the disproportion and we've been working towards that. You know, last year, for example, the assembly took on the role of changing the housing laws in New York state because we knew that our people were being displaced and we fought with a vigor because we knew that if people are displaced, they become homeless. And if they become homeless, they be street because this is what we're seeing. And so I'm sorry, I need you to just repeat that last part you said that if they become displaced, they become homeless and then what? Oh, she's freezing. That's I'm sorry, we're having some technical issues. So I, okay. that's the reason why I asked you to repeat what you had said. My apologies. Okay. But if you could just say that again. Sure. When people become displaced, they um, become homeless and then they live on the streets and they're more susceptible to death on the street. Right. And so we've been working, I, I would say, in a piecemeal approach to try and fix the issues, the issues of economic justice, the issues of environmental justice, the issues of housing justice. But now what we've seen with this pandemic is that all that work is coming to a head where if we don't like bring this to the forefront, we're going to continue to work in silos and in se separate, right? Dealing with one problem at a time rather than looking at a system and really dismantling a system that puts our communities at higher risk. So I think that that's the lesson, right? Every time we pass a law or we put a policy in place, we need to look at the equity, that policy and how it's affecting minority communities. Not when we're in the middle of an emergency, but before we get there. Um, and so like for me, that's been the most valuable lesson of all of this, looking at that social justice piece um, from the lens of the most vulnerable has to be part of our mission. That has to be the mission statement for what we do as elected officials. So that's wonderful from being uh, a person of influence and having that say in representing the community. But how does one being part of the community elevate their standards and their, their way of, of just being informed, uh, knowing exactly how to just shift and, and transform their, their way of living? I mean, I what kind of resources are really out there? I mean, it's unfortunate, the, the, the situation that we're in right now. But I think right now what's most important is that we start educating our people on how to move forward and how to elevate themselves. Absolutely. Look, access to information is so important. One of the things that I've criticized from day one on this pandemic is that none of the material, for example, the governor goes on TV and does a press conference. It's in English. What happened to Spanish? What happened to all of the you know, Chinese languages? What happened to the African dialects? Like there's no translation for this valuable and vital information, right? And so we have to make a point of getting access to information um, as part of the work that we do every day. When people are informed, they organize, right? We've seen that, for example, I, I pointed to the tenants movement. We see that when, when tenants are organized about what their rights are and what the process is, they come together and they build movements, right? And I think that that's what it's about. It's about making sure that we're that we as elected officials in my role, I'm empowering the voices of those in our communities so that they can speak on behalf of what they're seeing on the ground. And as far as the people who are living in our communities, we all have to make sure that we're engaged and involved. We get desensitized sometimes, especially with politics. I can't tell you how many times I walk down the street and people say, oh, you politicians, you're all the same. Right. And that's true. Right. Because reputation is what makes people feel that way. Right. But we have to understand the power within us to change that. If you don't like who's representing you, run, you know, um, find someone who can run, find someone who represents your values and put that person in office. But if we just don't vote, then we're letting the powers that be continue to exist without challenging that, without disrupting that. And I think that that's um, the change that we've started to see in our communities and that we should continue to see after this pandemic. Well, that's a beautiful note to end on because it's very important, especially considering it's an election year. Absolutely. So uh, where can people go to seek these resources that you were referencing? Sure. So I want to first um, give the hotline for mental health. It's so important because we're grieving right now. Right. If you've lost a loved one and you can't say goodbye to that person, you can't send them off 
through a burial that you deem dignified, you're suffering, right? And I wanna make sure that I'm on the mental health committee and mental health has been a big part of the work that I do in the assembly and bringing access. So there's a mental health um, hotline that is monitored 24 seven in the state. And that's 1-844-863-9314. And in New York City, we have 1-888-NYC-WELL, which is the line for, um, for mental health in the city, but we can call both of those lines. Um, I also want to bring focus to domestic violence. Um, as people are quarantined together in small quarters, we have to make sure that we are um, cognizant of the fact that abuse exists still in our community, unfortunately. And there is also a domestic violence and sexual assault hotline that exists in New York State. And that number is 1-800-942-6906. Um, obviously our offices, get to know who your elected official is, um, Google them, follow them on Facebook, follow them on Instagram and hold them accountable, right? Like if you email me and I can't get back to you, you should call me out. And that should be part of what we do with the elected officials that are um, in office right now and that are working on our behalf. And so I invite you all to follow us to find out who your elected official is. If you want to find out who represents you, you can go to NYC map portal and put in your address and that'll tell you who your elected official is um, and with a phone number and everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking the, the time to just educate people on the importance of understanding that in essence, you, you all work for us, right? You're mm -hmm. our voices. We absolutely work for you. And it's not good enough to just come around when we need a vote. This is a time where our communities need to stand together. Um, and we're here to help. Thank you. And thank you for stating that. Because, yes, we are all in this together. Thank you once again for taking the time out to share your wisdom with our viewers. And for you guys, um, if you're interested in learning more about Assembly Member Carmen de la Rosa, you can follow her on Twitter and Instagram at CN de la Rosa. So we do have to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll learn how one food pantry continues to serve the community during this pandemic. Don't go anywhere.